Hello lovely people and some other people who aren't feeling too lovely right now because you've been locked in your houses for a while and it's starting to make you want to throttle a cushion. I hope this video will be helpful for those of us isolating due to the coronavirus but also once it's gone. To those who need tips on working from home or spending time at home whilst ill or recovering. Here in the UK the government has said that no one aside from key workers should be leaving their home for any reason other than to buy food, medicine or to take one form of daily exercise. Thus we have been in isolation lockdown for almost three weeks now and many disabled, chronically ill and elderly people have been shielding for longer than that. Shielding is a measure to protect people who are clinically vulnerable by minimizing all interactions with others, including staying at home for 12 weeks and avoiding all face-to-face -face contact, except with your carers and family members who apparently do not need to isolate, according to the government. Which makes no sense, since they could very clearly come into contact with and then come back to you and... Anyway, for those of you who've lived extremely healthy lives up to this point, social distancing and indeed isolating, if you think you have symptoms, is probably pretty weird. You're probably not used to the number of times you leave the house every day being restricted or something stopping you from hanging out with your friends. And you're probably facing extreme boredom, anxiety, aimlessness, and a little thing we like to call cabin fever. But don't worry, don't panic. As a chronically ill person who has spent pretty much the last decade isolating, I've got you. Even before COVID-19 hit, I probably left the house four times a week, and two of those were for a gentle stroll around the local park with the dogs. Don't worry, they did have other walks, just not by me. I saw only a few faces every week, and I worked largely from my home office or my bed. Other than not being able to go for a weekly dinner at my sister-in-law's house or step inside a supermarket, who knew I could miss supermarkets this much? My life doesn't really feel that different despite being locked in my house, because I've already learnt the coping strategies to keep me sane. I am a social isolating pro, and I'm here to help you cope by sharing the tips and tricks I've learnt. In descending order, because I like the way that builds to excitement. Disclaimer, these may not all apply in all countries because lockdown laws obviously will differ. 14, get dressed. If you have experience of working from home or being ill, you already know this, but it's all too easy to let your days become essentially slush. They just merge into one another, and it's difficult at that stage to kind of pick them apart or even get motivated. My solution is to get dressed even if I'm too ill to go to bed and that dressed is just into a different pair of pajamas. The daily routine of changing your clothes, washing your face and brushing your teeth helps to wake up your brain and put it to sleep again at night. Whether you're trying to get work done or you're using this time to learn a new skill, it's important to distinguish between different times of the day and to flip the switch that gets you started. 13. Don't write a time schedule. If you've clicked on this video about how to isolate and not lose your darn mind, you've probably also read some other articles or seen some other videos about how to stay productive while spending time at home. They've likely all told you that a schedule is important, and it is, but prepare for the important bit. Don't put times in your timetable. This is something that I've learned from being ill. Some things are going to take longer than you expect. Some things will surprise you by taking less time. And if you give yourself a time schedule, all you're going to feel is failure and anxiety. You'll be constantly watching the clock, making sure you're running to time. And then of course you won't be because working from home is very different to working in an office. Just like being at home when well is very different to being at home when ill. Write a list of things you'd like to do in the order you would like to get them done. Work through your list, including lunch, which happens at a very flexible time when working from home, because now you'll be cooking rather than just grabbing a sandwich, and you'll feel a sense of achievement as each thing is ticked off. The one timed thing you should clearly set is the end of your day. You can do that in terms of X number of hours after you started work, thus giving you more flexibility in the mornings, or at a specific time. Make sure that you wake up and go to sleep at healthy times to ensure that you get enough sleep. And if you're focused on productivity, then make sure to give yourself evening time when you don't need to berate yourself for not being productive. Equally, although in the short term it can feel really nice to be lazy, in the long term it isn't good for your mental well-being. So planning out activities and setting goals can really help you to feel motivated and stop you from feeling down. But don't let those same goals beat you over the head if you take longer than expected. 12. 
Working first. When you go to school or work outside the house, your day is generally broken up by many little things. At school you move from classroom to classroom, often seeing different people in the hallways, and the subject changes between rooms. In an office you might move between meetings, chat with a friend as you make tea or head to the toilet and take a break for lunch. All of these things help to keep you motivated and fresh. When you're sat at home, however, with no face-to-face -face interaction, long stretches of time make your brain run down low. You need those little bursts with breaks. Every 45 to 60 minutes, take a moment to shake yourself off. Walk between every room of your house or change the topic you're working on. And I know, you don't want to seem like you're a slacker who isn't doing enough or working hard enough, but my God, these are exceptional times. And if you can't give yourself a little breathing space now, when are you going to? It's advice I can sometimes find hard to swallow. Wanting to just eke out my last little bit of concentration but that is never a good idea, as my work at that point is pretty shoddy. Take a break, and when you come back, you'll be better. Even five minutes on that craft project that you're working on in a different room can give you a fresh perspective on what you're currently doing. This applies to fun stuff too. Playing your favourite computer game for hours on end? Starting to see a decrease in your ability? Take a break. Having a nice, chill time on your sofa? You deserve a break too. Blow the cobwebs out of your brain, and everything is more fun. 11. Go for rides in the car. I struggle a lot with chronic fatigue, so sometimes moving is a big effort. Yes, all movement. Getting dressed feels like too much. Getting out of bed feels like too much. But my god, if I had to stare at my bedroom ceiling anymore, I will certainly lose my darn mind. When you're getting cabin fever and the world just feels too small, a really lovely thing to do is get into the car and drive. Not you, ill person. You are the fancy Lady Penelope in this situation. I love looking out of the window of the car and just seeing rolling hills or people in town and knowing that life is continuing, even if I'm in my pyjamas. For me, because I'm shielding and can't go into shops or any building other than my house, I like being taken around in the car and just drinking in any views I can't see from the windows of my house. It's my fun daily expedition. And I still stay within my safety bubble. 10. Stand on the other side of your front door. Just the other side, maybe even two centimetres out, preferably when you can't see another human. Smell the air outside. Let rain fall on your face. Crunch gravel under your feet. Do whatever you can to give your brain different sensory experiences to those in your house, and thus keep your mind active and your mood up. The world is so much larger than the house or flat that you are currently trapped in. Remind yourself of that in a positive way, not with facts and figures about illness across the globe, but with small, sensory moments with nature. Nine, be realistic with yourself. Right now, there's a global pandemic. You may feel grief, you may feel anxious, you may be contending with a heavy brain fog that you have never felt before. Maybe you're dealing with illness and you just can't make your brain work the way it used to. Stop beating yourself up about taking a little longer than you expect. It's completely understandable. A wide open day of working from home can feel like it should be full of possibilities, like you should be able to get all 120 things on your to-do list done, but being over ambitious just leads to feeling overwhelmed. Set realistic goals, or even lower goals than you know you can manage, and you'll feel satisfied rather than disappointed at the end of the day. When I'm really ill sometimes, my daily goal is just sleep for more than 30 minutes. Tricky, but possible. Try and get the majority of things done before lunch, because you'll inevitably slow down mid-afternoon, but knowing that there's only a little bit of your to-do list left to do will give you the momentum to push through to the end. 8. Streamline your environment. Messy space, messy mind. Not only does tidying help you to focus on your work, it also gives you something to do. If you're currently finding the lack of shopping opportunities difficult, then tidying is also the chance to discover old things you've not worn for a while at the back of your wardrobe. Working from home is really tough at first, when all you're seeing are distractions. So work in bursts and use the breaks to do house things like putting the dishwasher on or hanging up the washing. Equally, when you're at home because you're ill, too much clutter can just feel completely overwhelming, especially when you know you don't have the energy to deal with it. Ask for help where possible, and if that's not possible, chuck everything into a box and then hide it. Don't you feel better now it's out of sight? 7. Stretch out your binge watch. This is a continuation of the structure we talked about earlier. Normally when I'm on bed rest due to migraines, I can't have the TV or my computer playing something because it just makes the migraine so much worse. That means I have to invent shows in my head to keep me occupied. 
When I was a teenager, I spent two whole years in that state. And I think the only way that I stayed sane was to make sure I had some structure to my life, even though my life was very internal. So I'd only play these TV shows I was inventing on certain days, like real TV at the time. If it's not Monday, you don't get to watch the next episode. But now we have Netflix and we're all spoiled. Trust me, when you're spending an extended amount of time at home, it's really helpful to watch shows one or two episodes at a time, but only on certain days of the week. It gives you something to look forward to and creates a schedule that's easy for you to keep. Six, exercise as much as you're able. Whether it's wriggling your fingers or benching a hundred pounds, just do as much as you're able to. Is a hundred pounds a lot? Did I use benching right? 20 minutes of exercise a day can boost your mood, no matter what kind of exercise. Take it at your own pace, do what makes you feel good, even if you just kind of bob around to some of your favorite music. Our physical health and mental health are linked, so by taking care of one, you help take care of the other. Five, be careful with your content consumption. Look, all personalities are different. Some thrive on the feeling of catharsis after watching a disaster movie, which, by the way, generally always ends with the hero still alive and thriving, so. But for some, the mere idea of watching such a film is stress-inducing. For most of us, we're desperate to find out as much as possible about COVID-19, to the extent that we're walking around glued to Twitter updates and the news app. The digital world is set up in such a way that there's always addictively more to see and more to read, even if the core message itself is nothing new. Do we know what will cure the virus yet? No. If I read 15 more articles, will I eventually get to the one that gives me the answer? Maybe. As such, I've taken to only checking the news and Twitter when I go to the toilet. That way, I know that once I've left the bathroom, I can't obsessively check headlines, so. I should probably add that I go to the bathroom about once an hour, so I'm always quite up to date. Apparently this is not normal, and some people only go to the bathroom once in a working day, and I'm baffled by that. The World Health Organization recommends that you seek information updates and practical guidance at specific times during the day from health professionals and the WHO website, and avoid listening to or following rumors that make you feel uncomfortable. If you need some coronavirus myths busted, then check out my video doing just that, which will be in the card above, and contains information from the World Health Organization. The same applies to online content. If you have a friend on Instagram or Facebook who constantly posts about how scared they are and how it's all such a drama and how they're like definitely gonna die because once when they were 16, they accidentally inhaled some secondhand cigarette smoke at a party, feel free to mute them. I've even muted some amazing disability activists who post really worthy, amazing, stuff but with facts and figures that if I'm already in a low or troubled mood can hit me really heavily. Instead I just check in with them and I'm feeling strong enough and go through all of the posts I've missed. There's an online argument currently about bloggers who are posting as they normally would do, photos taken months ago or even last summer, and talking about things that do not connect to the current crisis. Should they reference the coronavirus in each post? Is it important to have spaces where their audience can think about other things and have a rest from the constant drama? What are your thoughts on that? Let me know in the comments below. Four, be sociable. Being trapped in your house doesn't mean that you don't get to socialize with anyone. The word trapped probably didn't help there, did it? If you're the kind of outgoing person who'll miss your colleagues when you work from home, build socializing opportunities into your day and try a video chat with people rather than always emailing or messaging. Seeing a familiar face makes a big difference. You might feel low or anxious because you can't draw on the immediate support of friends and family to help you deal with a difficult situation and share your worries or concerns. But thankfully, the internet means keeping in contact is much easier. One of the things that it's easy to miss when we're all isolated or in homes is the joy of doing absolutely nothing with our friends. Just chilling. Try video calling a friend or colleague and work separately but together. Or watch the same film or both cook a meal. You don't have to talk to each other the whole time, it's just the companionship that makes it special. Three, have a weekend off coronavirus. How do you have a weekend when you're living in your house 24 seven and there's no marked difference between time on and time off? Take a weekend off coronavirus. No, genuinely, don't talk about the virus, don't read about the virus, don't watch news about the virus for two whole days. Take a break. You deserve it. Two, touch a plant. Make the most of any outdoor space you can access, whether that's your own garden, a balcony, or a tree growing out of the pavement. Being connected to nature helps your well-being. Studies show that even watching birds out of a window can help. Nature helps us to think of the big picture, to recognize that whatever is worrying us right now, the world will keep turning and the earth is a constant. 
open a window if you can and just breathe in some fresh air. Also, online gardening shops are still delivering, so maybe now is the time to start that little window box of flowers you've been thinking about, or the herb garden you'd like to live in your kitchen. And finally, number one, treat yourself. Microlifts are the tiny bit of happiness sprinkled throughout your day that boosts your mood. If you're moving around throughout your day, it might entail grabbing a good coffee at lunch, being smiled at by a stranger, sharing a joke with a co-worker, or your train actually arriving on time. And if you're at school, maybe your favorite teacher said you've done a really good job, or you didn't get homework today, or you had a great time with your friends. Just because you're at home now, you still need those little bursts of happiness. I treat myself to phone games. <laughs> If I've written enough words or pages or edited a video to a certain point, I get to play on my phone for a bit. <laughs> I'm currently obsessed with two dots, although I'm getting a little too obsessed, so any other recommendations are welcome. It's about adding value to your day. Lots of tiny blips of fun. Who's are going through a drama right now, okay? Give yourself a break. I just bought a fluffy tulle skirt to sit around the house in because that's what I needed to boost my mood today. It's all too easy to get drawn into a negative spiral when you're isolated and to lose your optimism for the future. Too much time spent self-reflecting and picking apart what's supposedly wrong with your life, be that relationships, work, family, well, it's just not healthy. So make fun for yourself and look after your mental health as you would your physical health. Do what you need to do to protect it. Stay safe and I'll see you in my next video.